business session for July 27th is in session. Maybe at some point in time the rest of the council will manage to get here. But for right now, we're not going to continue to waste your time. So let's start with our first uh, presentation on the art space market study report, please. And just because we're the only three here doesn't mean that we're not in, that there are others may or may not be interested. But we want to make sure, maybe they can watch on TV later. <laughs> but we're not going to waste your time while we're waiting. So please go ahead and proceed. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I'm Gary Sage, the research and policy officer for the Economic Development Corporation of Kansas City, Missouri. Um, we're here today to present the findings of the research provided by ArtSpace that was performed over the course of fall of 2016 and a little bit into 2017. It was uh, there to determine what the needs of artists are for Kansas City, Missouri, but also generally for the metropolitan area. I'm joined here today to my left is Wendy Holmes, who is a senior vice president for ArtSpace, and Consuela Cruz, the city's arts marketing coordinator, and behind me at least was a minute ago, it was Kathleen Florinar, you can just wave at him. Uh, the EDC's Development Services Specialist right behind me. Um, the focus on the research of the survey of metropolitan artists was to primarily to identify what the demand was for arts-related facilities in the areas of live workspace, but also in studio creative workspaces, commercial space for artists such as retail, office, food prep, that kind of thing, incubator space, and also theater space. Um, I just wanted to express my thanks to the city staff, Consuelo, Megan Krieger can't be here today. She's out of town uh, for their diligent help in encouraging artists to respond to the survey. I also want to thank the city, the EDC's charitable fund, the Hall Family Foundation, and the Muriel McBrien Kaufman Foundation for donating the funds to offset the cost of the survey with art space. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Wendy Holmes and let her go to town on the presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. I just wanted to ask Consuelo, do you want to say a few words before I go? Um, I, well, I would like to say just one really quick thing. I wanted to make sure that everyone was aware that the study um, aligns with the economic development strategies that are outlined under Advanced KC that were adopted in the citywide business plan and that are part of the KCMO Arts Convergence Plan, which is the roadmap for the Office of Culture and Creative Services. So I wanted to let everybody know if they weren't already aware that the, how these all tie in together. Oh, one more thing. I wanted to also add that uh, thank you for the artists and some of the arts organizations that are here who helped us not only promote the survey, but also participated in the survey. They're here in the audience. Great. Thank you. So thank you, council members and mayor, for having us come back to, to Kansas City. Our first adventure here was in August of 2015. One of the things I want to point out is, is that we believe in diversity. We have a white female, white male, and black male. I can see um, that. So you know, we, we brought you a diverse group. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And I brought my boss, Kelly Lindquist, who's sitting behind me, who's the president of ArtSpace. So all right. save Thank all you. the tough questions for him. Thank all you. Right. <laughs> so we'll give you a quick rundown of our findings of the artist market in Kansas City. And in case you don't have any background information on us, we'll just give you one slide with that information. ArtSpace is a nonprofit, and we are committed to creating and preserving affordable space for the creative sector. We have 46 completed projects in 30 cities and 19 states, and we've just broke ground on our 50th project in Mesa, Arizona. But we also have ones uh, taking shape in Chicago, in uh, Memphis, and in Denver as well, among other communities. So these spaces include both affordable, long-term permanently affordable residential space for artists and their families, as well as creative business space. So that takes the form of nonprofit arts organizations as well as creative enterprises and entrepreneurs. So there are many reasons why communities want to save and create and preserve space for artists. And it depends on what uh, cycle they're in, in a particular neighborhood or in a city. Sometimes it's about economic development. Sometimes it's about encouraging population growth in an area where there's not a lot of residential population. And sometimes it's about preserving affordability when artists have been displaced. You have neighborhoods in Kansas City that fit all of those profiles. 
So the goals of the study, and we did an online study, were to quantify the demand. How many artists and organizations need what kinds of space, where do they want to be located within Kansas City, and how do they want their space designed? What are the amenities that they're interested in? So this map shows you some of the areas that we toured when we were here in April of 2015. It looks at the neighborhoods that were suggested in the survey, and we'll give you more information about that in a moment. And then the green is the qualified census tract. So most of these neighborhoods and communities that we looked at in 2015 were in, the quali in a qualified census tract, with a few exceptions. And you may have questions about that. Um, along the way, and feel free to interrupt, of course. So you had 515 individual creative people who were interested in space. This is an excellent response from a community of your size. In Denver, we had about 650 responses. So for a community uh, of Kansas City size, you should be very, very proud. You have a very strong arts community. The majority of these people, and this is not unusual, were interested in some kind of shared creative space with specialized equipment, maker space, shared studios, and the like. The second highest demand was for creative workspace, so studio space where artists can come to a space and do their craft. And then you had a very strong response also for the residential component of a project, including the live workspace where artists can live and work within the same space and not need to rent a separate space in order to do their work. So who responded to this? Most of the respondents lived within the uh, parameters of Kansas City, but there were quite a few that used to live in Kansas City and would be interested in moving back were a project like this created. And then we went within a, about a 50 mile radius, and so there were also people interested you know, outside of that radius as well. And you can see a map of where the respondents were, so the dark green, uh, Kansas, central Kansas City is where the most respondents came from, but then the outlying areas you can see had, had a quite, quite a few respondents as well. So what were our key findings on the organization side? So we also uh, surveyed organizations and businesses. You had a, 101 respondents, and 71 of those were interested in space. That's a really, really strong demand. You have lots of businesses and nonprofit arts organizations who are in need of long-term and short-term affordable space. Most of those were from Kansas City proper, but 15 of those came from the greater Kansas City, Missouri area. <clears throat> So in a nutshell, that top level, and I'm going to go into some more detail here, but that top level information says to us that you could create up to 60 units of live work housing for artists. We take that 180 number that we're interested and divide that by three just to be conservative and safe. That number has worked for us very well. I think our gut instinct would tell us that you could probably go up to 80. Up to 40 work-only spaces could also be created. 3,000 square feet of creative commercial space, and that could be more or less depending on the specific needs of the businesses that answered the survey as well. 2,000 square feet of incubator space, and a theater in that small to mid-size range was something that came up a lot, and I'm sure you've heard many times before. So let's dig into this a little deeper. So what were the demographics of the people who responded to the survey? You had a nice age uh, range. You had 36% uh, of the artists were age 30 or younger, and 46% were between 31 and 50. You can see that we, you had respondents over 70 years of age, and that's pretty typical in our portfolio that you see people at every age range, and that makes for a dynamic community. And you also see a lot of uh, artists with children. 82% uh, of the artists did not currently live with children, but 18% did. So there's definitely need for family space as well. So what was the percentage of income the folks that responded to the survey made from their art? You have a very strong uh, artist population here in terms of 
what percentage of artists make their income from their creative work. 25% of interested artists made between 50 and 100% of their income from their art. Which nationally, that is, that is higher than you typically see. Um, you should be very proud of that. And 10% of artists nationally make 100% of their income from their art. So it's pretty typical that artists and creative people need to hold down two or three other jobs in order to uh, pursue their creative careers. And what we find is with stable, affordable space over time, they don't have to hold down as many jobs in order to be able to be successful creative people contributing to, to your community. So in terms of affordability, Almost 50% of the interested respondents were at or below 60% of the area median income in Kansas City. So most of the artists were needing space that was for people who are between 30 and 60% area median income. So how does that line up with HUD rental limits? If we, were, for example, were to use the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, it lines up very well. So you can see that most of the people needed uh, rents between 400 and 1,000. And you can see what the HUD rental limits are for an efficiency through a three bedroom. I'm throwing a lot of data at you. And I realize that you, know, you may have questions along the way. So again, please right. feel free to interrupt. What were the most common disciplines represented from the artists who were interested in residential space? Painting and drawing, that's pretty typical. Music is not typically number two. I would say number two, uh, Denver came up, music came up number two as well. So you're right in line with Denver in that regard. Uh, literary arts was strong as well as film and photography. So you have a strong arts community in this regard, but theater arts was also very strong. So what about private studio space? You had 208 respondents who were interested in private studio space. 120 of those respondents were only interested in studio space, but 88 of them were interested in both the residential space and the studio space. What can they afford to pay? Most could afford to pay 300 or less a month, and that translates into somewhere between 50 cents and a dollar per square foot per month, which translates to eight to 12 dollars a year. So for those of you who are in the real estate market, you, you don't normally think of, of rents in terms of monthly, you think of it in terms of annual. Artists mainly think of monthly. So what are they interested in, in terms of uh, preferred features? These are not going to be foreign to you. This is very typical. Creative people want space where there's lots of natural light, durable surfaces, high ceilings. Because you have such a strong mu uh, music community, soundproofing as well, special ventilation, et cetera. So there were a lot of people, as you could see, 319 who were interested in shared space with specialized equipment. And what do we mean by that? We mean spaces where people can come together and work on their computers and have access to special design software that may be prohibitive for them to buy themselves, where they could have a music recording studio space that they could rent on a daily or weekly or monthly basis, where they could have access to rehearsal space, classroom space, space with 3D laser printers, all of those kinds of things. I know you have spaces already in your community for those kinds of ventures. It's clear that there's more demand than you have space for here now. So on the organization side, and I found this very impressive as well, 71 respondents are interested in renting creative space. 34 of these are nonprofit, but 25 of them are for-profit organizations. S many of them are interested in a long-term lease, but also there's a lot who are interested in a short-term lease. <laughs> so a short-term lease might be for a special event or a festival, whereas a long-term lease would be an annual lease or a five-year or seven-year lease that would provide that longer-term stability. What was particularly interesting, interesting to me here is that 24 of these organizations have been in business for 20 years or more. So they have some stability already, but they don't have the kind of stable, secure, affordable space that they need. Most of these organizations, as you can see on the right, anticipate growth, anticipate growth in their audience, in their operating budget, in the range of services that they're providing, and in the number of staff that they employ. So you have a healthy, creative business community. 
On the long-term side, the, the businesses were interested in a storefront location. They were interested in the ability to be able to sublease their space occasionally to others. They were interested in theater and performing use spaces that, flexible spaces that could be adaptable for those purposes. And again, some of the same features that the individual artists wanted, the abundant natural light and the high ceilings and durable surfaces. So what were the preferred locations? And I know this is where it's going to get the most interesting for you all. And this is where we asked both the individual artists and the organizations where they preferred to be in the city. And many of them responded to more than one area. So Crossroads was number one, West Bottoms number two, closely behind Main Street, Midtown, Westport, Troost, and East Bottoms. Now on the business side, it pretty much lined up the same way, except that more businesses were interested in Westport. So I don't know if that surprises any of you, but that is, uh, that's an indicator of where your creative people want to be. So what are our recommendations based on this data? So we recommend, and we have three different recommendations for you all to think about, and they're not mutually exclusive. They're, they can all be done. Depending on the location, we would recommend up to 60 <coughs> units of affordable live work residential apartments, up to 40 units of private studio workspace, two to 3,000 square feet, could be more, of creative commercial co-working shared space with the kinds of building features, uh, either in a historic building or in new construction, but I have a feeling here it might be a historic building. And location within, located uh, with close access to public transportation. That's always key, especially for people who are at or below 60% of area median income. So the, the recommendation number one is an art space model mixed use facility that includes those things that we just discussed. And that, is, that creates an opportunity to create a critical mass in an area for people and their, for creative people and their families. It contributes to the vibrancy of an area. It helps provide much needed workspace for individual artists as well as uh, creative businesses and provides uh, economic impact through workforce housing. The challenge here, and the, every uh, recommendation has a challenge, of course, and this is only one of them, is that there's a higher overall cost than traditional affordable housing uh, only facility due to the non-residential component, but it also makes the projects and the neighborhoods more lively if you mix the two together, if you have the residential and the non-residential in the same property or in close proximity. So an example of a project like this that we have done, uh, this is a historic building in downtown Michigan City, Indiana, uh, where we created 44 units of live work housing and the, uh, the first floor of that building is all commercial spaces, all different kinds of creative businesses. There's also a resident run gallery on the first floor and that was a $13.7 million project. Also using low income housing tax credits, home funds, historic tax credits, et cetera. Those are some interior uh, views of that space. And then in Council Bluffs, Iowa, we renovated an old harvester warehouse, and this has 36 units of live workspace. This is also mixed use. There's 5,000 square feet of ground floor space, including a coffee shop, a meeting space, an award-winning florist. It has attracted a number of artists who have moved across the river to Omaha. And then this project cost was $11.2 million. It also included uh, historic tax credits, low-income housing tax credits, home funds, and a large philanthropic contribution from the Iowa West Foundation. So all of these projects are um, private-public partnership and include funding from the private sector as well as from public sources. And that's another view of that same building. And this is a community garden that is part of this project. And here are the funding sources. So you can see that you know, there's a nice spread between the public and the private sources. So almost 30% of the sources came from private sources, a first mortgage, um, a, a loan, another, and a sponsor loan, which is in effect um, the philanthropic contribution from the Iowa West Foundation, and then we deferred a portion of our developer fee. On the public side, you <coughs> see the home funds, 
You see a special program they have in Iowa called the Iowa Enterprise Zone Tax Credit. Uh, historic tax credits and then low-income housing tax credits was about 44% of that total equity. Here in Missouri, you have more tools than they have in Iowa. Right so now. that is a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> right now, it's really cool. Recommend, the second recommendation <coughs> is to educate the local development community and brokers within your community. Once other developers who might be creating space know that the creative market is a tangible, real market here where people can actually pay rent, then they begin to think about possibly carving out a few spaces here and there in their projects as well. We have done this in other communities where we've worked with the development community and, oops, wrong way. Um, one example of that was in Loveland, Colorado, and we'll tell you about that in a moment. But the opportunity is that you can spread out these creative spaces in more than, at more than one project. It helps to promote a whole ecosystem of creative space and helps provide much needed space for all of those creative people that took your survey. The challenge is that it doesn't create that same critical mass. It achieves a different goal and there's less control over where that new space is created and will it be kept affordable over time, of course. Yep. So one of the uh, case studies in this regard was in Loveland, Colorado, where there was a developer who found out about the information from the market study and decided, oh my goodness, I need to take advantage of this information and, and create space for the creative community. So he created 27 works studios with a gallery. He created a maker space with 3D printer, 3D laser printers and wood, wood cutters, and he created a co-working space. So this was a very uh, wonderful result of taking the information that was available to this community through the market survey and really running with it. All of those artists pay rent and all of those projects cash flow. So just so you know. Um, the other recommendation that we have is that you look at some kind of shared space with a creative anchor tenant. You have over 24 organizations who have been in business for 20 plus years. They could be, some of those could be an anchor tenant in a development that might include several creative businesses and shared office space and working studio space and that it could even be industry specific, for example, for your music community. And we have an example of that to show you as well. So creating a shared space environment helps to provide space for multiple organizations, multiple artists. It doesn't have the residential component, but it satisfies a space need that's deep within your community and also helps to create a vibrant and active hub for the arts. It may be more challenging to fund. There's not programs like the low-income housing tax credit that can be used for this. It could be a new markets tax credit project with historic tax credits as well. There are other ways of funding projects like this, but you definitely have the demand to consider a non-residential project as well. A great example of this was recently done in Fort Collins, Colorado, where a new nonprofit was formed called the Music District. And it's a campus of four buildings that contains rehearsal space, recording space, event space, and other gathering space for the music industry there, which is growing by leaps and bounds, partially because of the presence of this campus of buildings. <clears throat> Our next steps for you to consider is to make a decision on the project paths, the type, the location, using some of this information as a guide. Identify top two to three sites, buildings, neighborhoods for creative space development. Form a leadership task force to keep this information alive. I know that you've already done some of that work through some of your committees and then share this information with the real estate community. They will be interested in this too, both on the for-profit and the nonprofit side. And identify, to move forward with an art space project, for example, identify pre-development funding that would help move a project forward. And we have ideas about that, but we would love to hear from you. So that ends my formal presentation. And okay. open it up for questions. questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, really just to, um, as I look at your, well, first of all, great job, and thank you for all the hard work. Um, 
it's not easy. Hurting artists is a lot like hurting cats, I find. So, <laughs> good job. Um, just to really point out, as we as you talk about the next steps and identify uh, some sites, I would just um, point out to you that as part of the Choice Neighborhood Grant, uh, we recently advanced the art space uh, project along Independence Avenue, which uh, should be under construction <laughs> in the next few months. And their plan is roughly, as I recall, about 30 units that includes retail and maker spaces for artists. So, um, and that's being done by Bryn Shore Development. So just to, to, to um, you know, um, good ideas seem to have a way to make their way around. And it certainly has in this case um, with that particular development. So I can hook, hook you up with them. But just to suggest there's, there's some movement in that already. That's great. Thank you. Councilman Fowler. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And this is just a quick question to satisfy my own curiosity. Uh, it looks like a number of the spaces that artists are interested in have 10 foot plus high ceilings. Why? I guess my question. So a lot of visual artists in particular have big canvases and sculptures and other kinds of things that require that volume of space, but also it's about the natural light that can come in from having the higher ceilings. Also, a lot of these projects are in historic buildings where the ceiling height is already at 10, 11, 12 feet or higher. And artists naturally gravitate to those spaces. As, as one who has somewhat of a height aversion, a oh. lot of climbing <laughs> on a ceiling. Kind of, but thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Others? Um, I think at some point we may need to get a slightly deeper dive if we're going to proceed with the recommendations that you have. Um, and uh, uh, I'll certainly want to find some way of doing that in some organized fashion so that if we do decide, and I personally am in favor of following your recommended next steps to get this done, but, uh, you know, you've done this before, right. and I don't see any great need to reinvent wheels that have been reinvented several times. So with some guidance, I think maybe we can take advantage of your next steps and move forward that way, Fantastic. if that's okay. Fantastic. Okay. We're very interested in that as well. All right, great. Anybody else? Any councilwoman? Thank you. It took me a minute to kind of glance through the slides to get up to speed a little bit. I see the focus is on affordability, um, and I think that's good. We've had a lot of discussion recently about affordable housing citywide for all sectors of the community, um, seniors, young people alike. Um, how would this apply? And I don't know where we are in our housing policy right now, but have you had conversations with um, the housing department about how this would incorporate in the overall scheme of providing affordable housing? So, yes, we had when we did the feasibility study, we were in contact with the Department of Housing, and we know that they have a goal of creating X number of units. I can't remember how many hundreds of units that their go that goal is, but this would definitely feed into that goal. Um, the nice thing about the way we work is that we keep these spaces permanently affordable. We continue to own and operate these buildings and then reinvest tax credits at the end of the tax credit compliance period and or refinance in such a way to keep these spaces affordable. So that is the very unique, unusual thing that, that we do as a nonprofit developer. And so in, in an instance, um, just for someone who's looking for affordable housing, would these be restricted to those that are artists only? Would you, how would you qualify them as artists mm -hmm. to qualify for these um, units? Sure. So there was, uh, there's actually been language added to the 2008 federal tax bill um, that oversees the tax code for the low income housing tax credit that has language in it that one can make a preference for people with literary or artistic pursuits. So yes, it's legal per fair housing that you have a focus on the creative population. Then beyond that, of course, we take it a step further and we have information sessions with interested tenants, help them fill out their applications, and then we form a committee that then interviews each of the artists, not to uh, jury their work, but to make sure that they have a commitment uh, for a body of work, that they want to live in an environment with other creative people, and that they are committed to being a part of this environment and want to give something get back to the community. So those are all of the the steps that we take, in short, to make sure that 
creative people are going to benefit from these spaces. If there is a unit available and there's no creative person to occupy it, then of course we would open that up to the next available person in the housing authority's um, list of people needing affordable housing. Okay. I mean, and I'm, I, and I'm, again, I apologize for being late for the presentation. I would like to follow up with you to learn more about your process. Um, two things of note I recognize is that the areas that you guys are focused on were on the west side of town. Um, and so there's a desire to incorporate the, the arts culture piece on west of 71, I mean, east of 71 as well. And I understand the dynamic building off the synergy that we have in the city, and that's very important. But as we move forward and we support um, the recommendations here, making sure that at least the, the co-working spaces that we will provide or will be supporting will be inclusive as well for those persons. And oftentimes the programming that we offer in our arts community does not always make it to the artists in, on, mm -hmm. on the other side of town. Mm -hmm. um, and so making sure we are intentional about being inclusive and in how we reach out to those persons. Thank I think you. that's extremely important, and we really put an emphasis on that marketing. We also, um, when we did our feasibility study in April of 2015, we were definitely looking at the 18th and Vine area and areas east of Troost as well as viable places and spaces where something a project like this could be located. But we've by no means made any decisions about that, and we'd want you all to be a part of that decision making with us along the way. So we don't have a particular bias or a preference. We want to serve people in the best way that we possibly can for your community today. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you all. Thank you. Don't thank you. Oh. You want to add something? Oh, I was going to say that m many of our projects, um, all of our projects actually, are very representative of the demographic breakdown of the residential community um, in a particular city. So in El Paso, for example, 80% of our residents are Hispanic. Um, in Chicago, 70% uh, of our residents are African American. So we are very conscious and conscientious about representing the demographic profile of your community within the artist community as well. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank There's you. There's nothing Thank further. You, Thank you very Council, much for the report. Uh, we'll arrange through Consuelo to follow up and uh, take the next steps. Thank Appreciate you so much for your time. Thank you. Consuelo, make sure you follow up with me on that, will you please? Thanks. Appreciate it.